Thank you. <laughs> um, my name's Jacqueline, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I'm sober today by the grace of God and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because it taught me many things. It taught me how to live. It taught me that I didn't have to drink anymore. And one of the things that it taught me was um, when I first got sober, there was this little man named Gene. And he was about this tall and about this round. But he was in service to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he would go to the uh, <clears throat> mental hospitals and the VA. And, and so when I got, you know, when I came in as a newcomer, he'd call me and say, I love you and God loves you. And I think, what does this little fat man want with me, you know? <laughs> Well, he became very important in my life because when I was um, 30 days sober, he drugged me to the VA hospital. We had to go up an elevator, and I was claustrophobic. And we went in this room, and they locked us in. And it was like, oh, and I freaked out. But he would tell me that I was OK, that God was in that room, and I was OK. So anyway, and then what he did was um, he took me to mental institutions. And uh, there, you know, I really got to see God working, you know. And um, I didn't want to go, of course. And it was contempt prior to investigation, which I found out uh, down the road. Um, so when I say, when I stand here and tell you that I know in my heart and in my soul that I'm sober by God's grace and nothing else, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And I always ask God, <clears throat> please, God, carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Help me not to exaggerate. If the fish is only this big, tell the truth that the fish was only that big. And so um, I was born into um, <clears throat> an insane family. That's the only way I can put it. And um, <clears throat> I was uh, a fear-based. I was born fear-based. The day that I was born, I was, you know, fear-based. Because they um, took me and they put me in isolation because I was born with a whooping cough. And so I was isolated from the very, very beginning. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, so my life went on like that, and I really didn't know what was really happening in my life. It was all hearsay. You know, it was all hearsay. And um, so uh, from, you know, from there, um, I, uh, like I say, my mother was a rage rageaholic. She would go to St. James Park, which was Skid Row, and she'd get involved with these alcoholics. She'd uh, bring, you know, she'd bring them home, clean them up, and they'd be around for a while. And the next thing you knew, they were gone. So um, <clears throat> I got used to people leaving my life, you know. And um, when I went to school, um, I was in the, I think, fourth or fifth grade somewhere around in there. And um, there was this teacher, and his name was Mr. Howell, and I will never forget him. Because he was one of God's angels. He was one of God's angels. And he, you know, um, while class was going on, he knew I wasn't there. You know, he, I was there physically. But mentally, I was out flying around the room. I didn't know how to be present. Absolutely no idea how to be present. And so he kind of, you know, uh, took me under his wing and he um, 
got a hold of the school nurse, and he said what they did was they um, <clears throat> they um, got a school psychologist to evaluate me. So my mother, who was never really present in my life because she was so busy chasing men to make her feel better and her life complete, that there was no time for us kids. And I had um, four brothers and two sisters. And um, so anyway, they, um, the school psychologists came in and they evaluated me and they told me that there was something wrong with me, you know. So there's been something wrong with me, you know, just about all my life until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And anyway, um, <clears throat> my mother uh, agreed to become a, a, a room teacher and take us on an outing to Alma Rock Park. And uh, what happened that day, uh, it was a potluck and people brought stuff and we were very poor, you know, we lived, we were very poor. And uh, so uh, my mother <clears throat> went and she bought some kind of overripe bananas. That was her contribution to the, you know, to the um, outing. And so um, what happened was um, nobody was eating the bananas, and she said to these kids, um, have a banana. And what they said was, we don't want any rotten bananas. And I took that on. I took it to the depths of my soul. And I carried that pain of the shame and hurt of my mother. And I carried that for years. And so, <clears throat> anyway, you know, I went on about my life and uh, I found alcohol when I was 13 years old. And, you know, I was one of those people that uh, I started hanging around with kids that were older than me, and there was this place called Howl's, and it was a drive-in, and all the big kids used to go there. And so um, this guy, Bob Torres, he, he was, boy, he was big. I mean, he looked like he was about seven foot tall, and he had hair out to here, and he had a car, and he had a bottle of gin. And so, you know, there are four of us that got in his car. We parked in back of Hal's drive-in, and they passed the bottle around. And when it came to me, I guzzled. And they pulled it away from me, and I was mad. <clears throat> but, you see, I was one of those, one of those people that um, got sick. I got a beating when I got home because I was trying to sneak back in the window that I snuck out and there was my mother. And so I um, threw up and uh, the next day I wanted more. I wanted more. So I was a, you know, um, a pig drinker from the very start. I drank like a pig. And that's the description of my alcoholism, you know, I drank like a pig. And so um, I went off to school, and by this time, um, my first husband was in my life. And um, I was 17, and he was 18, and we um, got married when I was 17. I was still in high school. He went off to Fort Ord, and I was in my glory because I could drink openly. Uh, I could. I was still going to high school, and um, I was acting like a single woman instead of a married one. And um, so anyway, uh, I married him to get away from my family. Because in my family, you know, uh, I was taught to lie, I was taught to cheat, and I was taught to steal. 
And I'll just touch on how to bring that into my life was um, one of my brothers um, <clears throat> stole somebody's watch and the detectives came to my mother's house and um, she said, don't you dare tell that your brother's got that watch because they hid it. And so when I was asked, it was like, no. So, you know, that was the first conscious time that I remember of lying. Other than that, I was not my buddy. I was not present in my house. It took me a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous to get present. And um, so from there I got married, and, and we were married for five years, and my daughter was born, and... Uh, I was, you know, when I was pregnant, I had all this attention, and so it was nice to be pregnant with all the attention. And then came reality. And, I, you know, after she was born, I did not want to be a mother. I did not want the responsibility, because I didn't know how. You see, I didn't know how to love, because I was never really loved. My father left home before... Uh, my father left me before I was born, you know, and um, the first um, time I heard about my father was uh, we received a uh, package from the Philippines, and uh, as my mother opened it up, there was a coconut, and my father was in the CBs, and there was a coconut, and her first words were, it's from that dumb SB, your father. Oh, I had a father, you know. And I was about three or four years old, maybe even five at the time, when I was that I found out I had a father. So anyway, that was life, you know. And, and I did, you know, I just showed up and and did, and I watched people do, you know what they do, and so I started to do what people did. And then um, I, um, at five years sober after my daughter was born, I couldn't do life. I could not do life. And so I had this, these friends who um, wanted to adopt a baby. And so I was seeing a psychologist at the time. And the psych I was going to him, of course, and I was lying. I was not telling the truth. You know, I just made up all these big stories that were going on in my head. And he said, you know, there's a place where you could go and you will be with people just like you. So I thought, Oh, boy, I get to go away. And so um, I had to sign some papers saying that I would stay there for three days. So I was overjoyed, you know, because I wouldn't have to cook. I wouldn't have to do anything I didn't want to do. If I wanted to stay in bed all day, I could stay in bed all day. So anyway, I went and I bought some new clothes. <sighs> And packed a little suitcase. And off I went to Agnew State Hospital. I thought I was going on a retreat or something. But I wound up in Agnew State Hospital. In those days, they really didn't um, do much with alcoholics. Except lock them up in nut houses. And so... Um, Anyway, I stayed there, and once I, once I went in there, I knew that I had made a st mistake. I knew it. It's like, oh, get me out of here. Well, there was no getting out, let me tell you. Absolutely not. And so, you know, there were people in there that um, today, because of my alcoholism and the God of my understanding, I have compassion. 
I have compassion in my heart and my soul for what I saw in Agnew State Hospital. You know. So anyway, uh, fortunately, you know, they, they did all these tests to see if I was hearing voices and all that and blah, blah, blah. And then there was this one uh, psychiatrist there. And she said to me something that was really important. She said, you don't belong here. And she says, so what I want you to do is I want you to write a letter and tell them why you don't belong here. So I wrote this letter. I don't know what I said today. But I wrote this letter. And, and it must have been God-directed. So that was my first um, experience with doing an inventory. It was an inventory looking at me and saying why I didn't belong there. And so anyway, um, that psychiatrist made sure that I was released. And so um, I went home and um, I just knew, I, you know, I just drank and drank and drank and drank. And I knew that um, I needed to leave because my husband caught me cheating two or three times and he you know he forgave me so anyway I um, started to divorce him and he wanted to keep my daughter and of course if you left your kids behind you were a bad <coughs> mother and nobody was going to tell me I was a bad mother even though I was not present in her life because I drank like a pig. So anyway, I said no, and I left, and we got a divorce. And uh, what I did is I drug my daughter through the muck, through every nick and cranny and abusive situation there was. I couldn't be a mother, I couldn't be responsible. So I continued to drink for years and years and years. And um, it got to where um, my drinking was out of control. I didn't have a choice anymore. I did not have a choice to drink or not. And, you know, there were times that um, I um, didn't want to drink. I didn't want to drink, but I drank anyway. And by this time, I was in a crowd that um, I had found my people. They were alcoholics. They partied like I partied, you know. And um, we got very friendly with the bartenders. So when 2 o'clock came, we didn't have to go. The other people had to go. And, you know, there were days, those were some of the days that I would say, I'm not drinking today, I'm going home. Three to four o'clock in the morning, I was on my way home. I had to get up and go to work in a couple hours. By God's grace, I didn't kill anybody. Because I prided myself on running red lights down the El Camino in Santa Clara County. I wanted to see how many I could run. And I was driving a 280ZX and a drag rod, going pshaw, just having a great old time. And I'm lucky that I didn't kill anybody. So, you know, um, Drinking took me where I had no control. Drinking took me to where um, my family didn't matter. My daughter didn't matter. The only thing that mattered to me was to gamble, 
to go to bars, to get in fights, you know, to be the queen of I'll drink you under the table. And that's, you know, that's what I got to do really well. Whether you were a man or a woman, I could drink you under the table. We used to play these little games in the bars where they put a dime <clears throat> on the top of a, a glass or a bar napkin. They'd, they'd wet it and put the bar napkin to where it would sit there. And then we took a cigarette and burned to see who, whoever burned the napkin and the dime went in, you had to drink two shots. So that was fun, you know, it was fun. So anyway, um, how I got to Alcoholics Anonymous was not of my own making. It was not of my own making. Um, <clears throat> oh, by this time I had been arrested. And, uh, of course, um, I have a smart mouth when I'm drinking. Don't tell me what to do. And so when the red light came on and the cop came over the window and he said, get out of the car. And I said, I hope you know you almost caused an accident. <laughs> And he made me get out of the car and do the sobriety test. I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember my social security number. So he had the nerve to put the handcuffs on me, throw me in the back of the cop car, and off we went to the San, San Jose Police Department, which was on First Street. They took me in there. They chained me to a table. And um, they made me pee. And so from there I went out to Elmwood, where they made me, um, they put me in this cell with this woman, and she kept going, <gasps> and she says, if you do that, it'll level your, uh, lower your blood alcohol content. <laughs> So, well, how did I know? And then she told me, she said, whatever they say, you tell them it's not the truth, that you didn't do it. So, when they asked me questions, it's not the truth, I didn't do it. And uh, I found out later she was a prostitute. And, you know, I was sitting right next to her, and she befriended me, and she was nice. And um, so anyway, I just um, had to, st oh. and then they let me call home. So I called home, and I said to my husband, guess what? He said, you're in jail. I didn't know how he knew, but he knew I was in jail. He knew because he had watched my behavior. He had watched how I drank. And today I have a sneaky feeling that somewhere along the line, he went to Al-Anon. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, what, um, so anyway, uh, he knew I was in jail, so he came and got me. And uh, So by this time, I was living a double life. I had a lover, and I had a husband that I had for nine years. And I came home one day from work, and I didn't do my usual. And my usual was to go to the refrigerator to get something to drink. And he said to me, I have called Alcoholics Anonymous today. They said you should call yourself, but I know you won't. So I found out where there's the meeting. I said, what did you do that for? And he said, don't you remember? And at that time, a scene came in front of my head, and 
I remembered the night before, it was my last drunk. I was down on my knees with a razor in my hand, pretending I was going to slit my own wrist. He was physically holding me and saying, I have got to call someone to come and get you. I can't take this anymore. So I went off to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was down some steps. And uh, it was one of the oldest meetings in the Santa Clara Valley. And um, there was a bunch of old people there. I was a smoker at the time. They were smoking. And they had these bags, you know. So how could, I knew they were drinking, because they had a bag that looked like a six pack. But it was Coke, Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I'd better clarify that. <laughs> so anyway, I, I went down there, and, and it was down some steps. It was in, the, in a church basement down some steps. And there were people there, and they were laughing and joking and just having a good time talking to one another. And I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified because I didn't know how to act. I had no idea how to act. So after the meeting... Um, it was at that time my husband went and collected the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous, and thank God for the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this old lady came up to me, and she looked like an owl. And she said, my name is Ruth, and my coffee pot is always on, and here's my telephone number, and my first thought was, what do I need with an old lady like you? Because I was hip, slick, cool, wearing, um, my hair was two-toned, I was blonde in the front, and dark in the back, and I was about um, maybe 25 pounds lighter than I am right now, but I was cool. But so I didn't need her. So anyway, uh, what happened was, um, I went home that night and I had a can and a half of beer. First of all, I asked him. He said, I don't care. But you know, no, it was like half a can of beer. Because I was trying to drink it. And it was like somebody had their hands around my throat and I couldn't drink anymore. So God came to me with a chokehold. <laughs> and um, so. Uh, I didn't drink anymore that night, and uh, it was about four days later, I asked him, I said, are there any more of those things? He said, what things? I said, well, we went the other night. So at that time, he pulled out the meeting guide of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I went down it, you know, and I found a an all men's meeting in a recovery home. No, I found a recovery home meeting where there was just a lot of men. So um, he took me. I, was, I had stopped driving by this time because I was so paranoid. I was paranoid. It's like, ah. And so um, he took me there, and I made him go in and ask if I could come in. So he went in, and he asked if I could come in. And they said yes. So that was my second meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in an all-men's recovery home. And at that meeting, what they did is they started talking about God. Get me out of here. <laughs> Get me out of here. But I stayed and they talked about God. And then what they did, they got up and they read out of this book, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't understand a word of what they were saying, but they read out of it. And they called it the Big, big Blue Book. And I thought, how were words in a dumb book going to save my life? I couldn't understand. Today I'm here to tell you 
that the words in this dumb book have saved my life because they're solutions. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, I never fit in in life. And um, sometimes today is uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I feel like I don't fit. And, you know, I, I get closed into self. And I get selfish. And I get self-centered. And I get to the point where nobody likes me. And sobriety gets hard. It's like, do I want to do this anymore? It's so painful. Do I really want to do this anymore? And... Um, Thank God I have a, sp a sponsor that, um, you know, shares her truth with me. That shares her truth with me. See, she's had those thoughts too. But she just keeps, keeps keeping on. And uh, what, she, um, what I've been taught to do is show up no matter how I feel. If I paid attention to how I feel, I'd be dead today. I would. And so I, you know, one of the things that, um, it's been a key uh, paragraph for me lately, is um, you know, um, I, my hats are off to people that have all these wonderful relationships and they get along so well all the time and they're happy, joyous, and free and all that stuff. And well, guess what? Sometimes in my house it's not like that. Okay? So I congratulate all of you that's like that. Let me know your secret. Okay, so it says, if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be dubious luxuries for normal men, but for the alcoholic, these things are poison. Okay? It says, we turn back to the list, for it held the key to the future. We were perhaps, we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and all of its people really dominated us. In that state, <clears throat> the wrongdoings of others, fancied or real. Wow. It's a wow for me had the power to actually kill. How could we escape? <clears throat> we saw that these resentments must be mastered. But how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. This was our course. There goes those directions again. We realize that people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. Ourselves are sick too. Okay. <clears throat> we ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick person. How can I be helpful to him? God, save me from being angry. Thy will not mine be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chances of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people. But at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. That is powerful stuff for me. It gives me directions. It gives me a solution. 
And it tells me that I don't have to be angry. It tells me that I'm not any better than anybody. I got the same stuff. And that I fit in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so what's happening in my life now is uh, my daughter and I have become we formed a relationship beyond my wildest dreams. We have a relationship today that um, is in my heart. And it, see, it's hard for me to let people in my heart and touch my soul. But we have a great relationship. And um, I, you know, for all the time I went, uh, traveled to school to, to go to Berkeley to school I would stay at her house and the, and the relationship started developing and, and I knew you know that when I would leave there I would kind of have a peace in my heart and it was like family there's family you know oh one thing I just forgot to tell you is uh, the man that I married at 17 left and divorced at 18 years sober, I got crazy and decided I needed him back in my life because I wanted my family. I wanted my family. I was like, oh my God. I ran on South Will, let me tell you. So anyway, um, we've been married this time 18 years. Uh, <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. So, you know, that's the truth. You know, I, I ask God, please help me be truthful and talk about the small fish and not the big one. And so um, it's been a struggle. And uh, like I say, over the years, my daughter and I have um, formed this up, absolutely wonderful relationship. And I long in my heart to be closer to her. So, um, <clears throat> In um, July, I went down there, and my husband and I had talked about moving closer to her. So uh, in July, I went down to babysit her cat because they went on a on a cruise. Six hundred dollar cat. I went to babysit, you know, a Persian, you know, and I every time I opened the door, I was afraid that cat was going to go out. So I had no peace of mind, uh, you know, and. Um, so I was down there, and um, so what I did is I went and looked for a house. Well, I was down there two weeks, and I bought a house. Because <laughs> I knew it was all of God. I forgot about self. I heard all these wonderful things, and I couldn't tell the difference between, was it? God's will or my will. So anyway, um, I bought this house. Ours went up for sale. We haven't sold it. Uh, plans are changing. So I just might be stuck here in Reading. <laughs> you know. So, you know, right now my life is um, unmanageable. And it's hard to sit and not take action on what I want. And at present, it doesn't look like I'm going, so you guys might be stuck with me. And um, so anyway, um, if there's anyone having problems with this program, or you think that you're not going to make it, or if you want to drink, or you want to die, there is a solution. And see, because I've wanted to do all that in my sobriety. I've wanted to drink, I've wanted to die, I just wanted to go somewhere. And I didn't get to do it. So, um, for me, uh, there's... Uh, 
this, I'm going to read a couple things out of the book. There's the spiritual experience. And this helped me in my early sobriety. Boy, did it help me. It says, the term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself in many different forms. Yet, it is true that our first printing gave many readers many, the impression that these personality changes or religious experience must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheaval. Happily for everyone, this conclusion was erroneous. I didn't have to find God within the first 30 days. I didn't have to find God in the first year. I found God in Alcoholics Anonymous by just looking at you guys and being amongst you and listening to you because I could identify. I could identify to my soul. So, you know, um, I didn't have to find God right away where I thought I did because if I didn't, I couldn't have the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not true. That's what this paragraph tells me. Then it says, in the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described. Though it was not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. I guess he didn't like what I said, but. <laughs> <laughs> Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such, tr my ego got in there, don't you know? Um, uh, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Many of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite, let's see, quite often friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. He really, he finally realizes that he has undergone a profound change, profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly be brought about by himself alone when often, what often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With a few exceptions, our members find they have tapped an un six, an inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception, their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of a spiritual experience. You can find that on page 14 of the big book. It'll tell you how to get through one. Our more religious members call it God conscious. Most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover, provided he does not close his mind off to all spiritual concepts. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerant or belligerent denial. We find that no one need have difficulty with the spiritual, spirituality of the program, willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery. But these are indispensable. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against 
all argument which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. And you know, you're going to hear some things in this program that you'll think, how stupid, how's that going to save my life? One of the things that sponsors, when I got sober, used to tell me to do, go clean your bathroom. I had the cleanest bathroom in town, okay? Because if I didn't go clean the bathroom, that was contempt prior to investigation. How do I know it wasn't going to work? So when I cleaned the bathroom, I was focusing on cleaning the bathroom and not what my head was saying. Not what my head was saying. Go drink, go drink, go drink. Kill yourself, kill yourself. It was clean the bathroom, clean the bathroom, clean the bathroom. So, you know, my thinking changed by cleaning the bathroom. You know, and then another one, they tell me, you need to eat something. Why do I need to eat? Just eat. So I would just eat, and I would feel better. You know, I would feel better. So, you know, newcomers, you know, um, had I not followed the stupid suggestions of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, were just as crazy as me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you've talked about the insane things that you've done, about the voices in your head, about, you know, how you wanted to blow somebody's brains out. Um, you know, all that stuff, I could relate. So you kept me here because I fit in. I fit in. I was no longer alone. And that big, big glass ball that you guys were all in, and I was laying on top saying, how do I get in there? cracked and opened, and opened up and I got in and I fit. Thank you.